How's that? Good morning. We are in Matthew at the end of chapter 20 and moving into chapter 21 this morning. If you have your Bible, you want to follow along with me, we'll pick up at the end of chapter 20. Jesus has been Through his words, through his actions, he has been instructing and teaching and communicating to his disciples, especially the twelve, as well as to the others who are following around, who he is, what he is doing, and why. He's been communicating this in a number of different ways through his teaching, telling them who he is, through his interactions with others, who he is as well as correcting their thinking as to why he is here, what the kingdom is going to look like, why he is going to Jerusalem. He's been trying to help them wrap their heads around the reality of who he is as Messiah, as the Son of God, as the Son of David, as the King, as the one who is coming in humility, as the one who is coming to serve and not be served, as the one who is coming to give his life a ransom for many, to take up the cross and calling them to follow him in this. Now this was important for them at the time because they had a number of misconceptions about who Jesus was. And he asked them at least one time that we know of, Who do people say that I am? And they give a variety of answers. Some say you're this, some say you're that, some say this. And we've seen a variety of different responses to him from different groups of people. And that really hasn't changed. If you were to go out and take a poll about who Jesus is in the world around us, you would come up with a number of different responses. Uh, Philip Yancey, a number of years ago, wrote a book uh, uh, called The Jesus I Never Knew. And in his introduction, he writes that there are, he's writing about the lots of perceptions and ideas about Jesus that he got growing up. And then as he got older, as he began to look around, he noticed there were many, many more. He said, if you were to peruse the books that are available, You might encounter Jesus as a political revolutionary, Jesus as a magician who married Mary Magdalene, Jesus as a Galilean charismatic, as a rabbi, as a peasant Jewish cynic, as a Pharisee, as an anti-Pharisee, as an eschatological prophet, as a hippie in a world of yuppies, as a hallucinogenic leader of a sacred mushroom cult, that athletes have come up with descriptions of Jesus. One pro football player said, I guarantee you Christ would be the toughest guy you ever played against. If he were alive today, I would picture him as six foot six, 260 pound defensive tackle. A professional baseball player said, I firmly believe that if Jesus Christ was sliding into second base, he would knock the second baseman into left field to break up the double play. And on and on and on. And if we look around today, he's writing a few years ago, but the landscape hasn't changed. And it's not just out in the world, it's in the church as well. If you were to go around polling church people and Christians about who Jesus is, you would get a number of different answers. Jesus teaches love. We need to love everyone. We need to just love and accept and love and love and love because love is love. Jesus said you are gods and so we are all little gods being like Jesus. And on and on and on. The landscape hasn't changed from the first century. Lots of questions about who Jesus is, and lots of misunderstandings about who Jesus is, and lots of opinions about who Jesus is, and lots of thoughts about who Jesus is. Who is this we're talking about? 
Jesus goes to great lengths to both show and to tell, to teach and to demonstrate through actions and words and encounters who he is, we should probably allow Jesus to speak for himself. So as we come here to the end of chapter 20, as Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, he has been teaching his followers who he is. He has been demonstrating that, and he's been trying to correct their understanding of who he is and what he is going to do once they arrive in Jerusalem. He has told them, I'm going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. Did they understand that? Not yet. But he has been presenting himself and his mission and his purpose to them. So as we are getting closer to Jerusalem, we're going to pick up here in chapter 20, verse 29. As they were going out from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So, just to understand where we are here, we're in Jericho, just crossing the Jordan River, just like Joshua and the people coming into the land, moving toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not too far from Jericho, but it's an uphill climb. So they're moving both horizontally and vertically as they are rising up to Jerusalem. Jericho is below sea level. It's down on not quite the level with the Dead Sea, but it's below sea level. Jerusalem sits up on a height. So here we are going, and Jesus is going with, that is, lots of people are following him. They have followed him, some of them from Galilee, the twelve and others. And they've picked up a few people along the way. But these are mostly people coming out of the Galilean area who have seen and heard and are familiar with Jesus. They're heading to the festival in Jerusalem, so there are lots of other travelers. We don't know how large this particular group is with Jesus, but there's a crowd, there's a multitude with him, and it's great. So this is a large group of people. Along the road there, behold, two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the multitude sternly told them to be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So we have these two blind men. They're probably beggars because they couldn't make a living any other way. And they are correctly identifying, they've heard Jesus is coming, they correctly identify him as son of David. This is a messianic title. They are thinking in terms of his messianic kingship at least. Son of David, in the lineage of David, the Messiah is going to come and sit on the throne of David. They cry out to him to have mercy on them. The people tell them to be quiet, which is rather interesting. If they've been with Jesus for any amount of time, this is an interesting response. What are they thinking here? It's possible that they're thinking that Jesus is really busy, that Jesus is an important man. He has things to do. He's got people to see. He, he doesn't need to spend his time with you poor, blind beggars. That is certainly a possibility. They may be thinking in the normal terms or the normal thinking of the day toward blind beggars. They've done something wrong, they've sinned, God has cursed them, they're outcast, put them aside, just ignore them. It's also possible, based on the way that Matthew sets this up, that some of them are still thinking in terms of the discussion that they have previously had. Can we sit on your right and left hand when you, come, when you bring in the kingdom? When you introduce the kingdom, when you sit on your throne, can we be in those positions of power? Some of them may be thinking in terms of, we're almost to Jerusalem, let's get there and establish the kingdom. We can't get distracted by these guys. We don't know exactly what their thinking is. But here they are trying to tell these men to be quiet, don't bother Jesus. 
Jesus is the one who is heading to Jerusalem with something on his mind. The closer he has been getting to Jerusalem, the more he has been talking about what his purpose in going to Jerusalem is. And being the only one who really understands what that is going to entail, I imagine the closer he gets to Jerusalem, the more focused he is in thinking about the reality of what's going to transpire in the next week or so. And yet, Jesus is the one who stops. Jesus is the one, verse 32, who stopped and called to them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened and moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Jesus is still moved with compassion for people. He is intent on his purpose of going to Jerusalem and fulfilling that purpose, but he doesn't allow that purpose to deter him from having compassion on the people. And here he, he stoops, he steps aside out of his journey to Jerusalem, steps aside to show compassion, to have compassion on these two outcasts, these two blind beggars sitting beside the road. The blind men won't be deterred, but Jesus is not distracted either. He's not distracted or deterred by the people, the crowd with him, who want him to move on. He doesn't allow his focus on his purpose to distract him from compassion on the people, because those two are the same. It's interesting here, the physical blindness, spiritual blindness contrast that is often set up in the gospel narratives, and I wonder if that's why Matthew brought our attention to this one here, because Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem as the Messiah, coming to his people, and we're going to see that there are not many people who notice. The people of God are spiritually blind, these two blind, physically blind men are the only ones who are calling out, Son of David, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on us. Everyone should be saying that. And the two that are physically blind are the only one who seem to spiritually see who Jesus is. That takes us into chapter 21. When they approached Jerusalem, they had come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. So we've come up the road, we've made it to the top, we're on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives sits to the east of Jerusalem, it's on a rise, on a ravine, and then there's down to the Kidron Valley and up the other side, and there is Jerusalem laid out before you. So from the Mount of Olives, you can see the city of Jerusalem laid out there. And I imagine this is always a very exciting thing for these people who are coming from Galilee with Jesus to travel down this road and see Jerusalem laid out before you. And on the eastern side right there would be the Temple Mount. And you could see the glory of the temple standing there in front of you. And it must have been a wonderful, breathtaking sight as they topped the mountain there. Jesus is going to send two of his disciples forward. Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a burden, a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them and brought the donkey and the colt 
and laid their garments on it on which he sat. The other synoptic gospels record one animal. Uh, Matthew records two, uh, which has led to some questions about that. Matthew just, I think, here records more details. The cult on which Jesus sits is tied there with its mother. And because it has not been ridden before, they bring both of them, both of the animals, to keep the colt comforted in this big crowd, and it's going to be ridden for the first time here. Jesus is going to ride this colt. He doesn't ride both of them. He rides the colt. The mother just goes along for the walk. Jesus is seemingly prophetic here, which is exactly the point. He foretells what they are going to find and what they are going to do. And if anyone objects, you tell them the Lord has need of them and they will allow you to proceed. And that's exactly what happens. And so they bring the animals back. Matthew records that this is in fulfillment of the prophet. He's, he quotes here Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah's prophecy as a whole is about God restoring Israel. Zechariah writes about 500 years before Jesus when the people of Israel have returned from exile and they are in the process of rebuilding and there's a lot of question and wonder about will God come back to Jerusalem. And Zechariah prophesies that those, to those recently returned from exile, in his mercy the Lord will return and inhabit Jerusalem and the nations will come and assemble and worship there. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, the nations in Israel will be judged by God and Israel's king will be restored and then after the judgment, the nations and the people of Israel will worship there together. So this is the context in which Zechariah is writing, and he gives this messianic prophecy of the king who is to come, and Matthew applies that here to Jesus. Jesus is coming as the king, but he is coming in a particular way. He's coming gentle and mounted on a donkey. A donkey is not a very majestic animal to ride. If you wanted to be majestic, you would ride a large horse. And that's what kings usually did. Kings would ride in chariots or on horses. If you were going into battle, you would choose one of those. If you wanted to display your power and authority, you would choose one of those. You would have a chariot pulled by one or two or four or however many horses you wanted. Or you would ride a large war horse. Jesus is riding a donkey, a colt that's never been ridden before. This is gentle and humble. He's displaying himself in a particular way. He's choosing to write this narrative in a particular way. And Matthew connects this back with Zechariah's prophecy about how their king would come. Gentle in this way. So the disciples begin to put their garments on the colt, and Jesus sits upon it. And the crowd, the multitude, then begins to get involved here. Verse 8, And the multitude spread their garments on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. John records that they, some of them cut palm branches, which would be nationalistic symbols going back to the Maccabean period. The Maccabean revolt, they used palm branches and palm leaves as national symbols. And so we're beginning to get this kind of going to Jerusalem and Jesus is the Messiah and he's going to establish the kingdom. And all of those ideas are beginning to come together here as this crowd begins to notice what is happening and get really excited about this. So they're spreading their garments on the road as they are laying the red carpet, as it were, to pave the way for the king to have a nice, smooth ride as he proceeds down through the Kidron Valley and up into Jerusalem. 
Verse 9, the multitudes were going before him, and those who followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Here they're quoting from Psalm 118. These are psalms, the Hallel psalms, these psalms that they would, oftentimes, pilgrims would speak and chant and sing these psalms back and forth to one another as they are arriving in Jerusalem for the festival days. And here they are specifically choosing these psalms to sing and chant and speak back and forth with one another as they are going before and following behind Jesus on this donkey. Hosanna is Hebrew for save us or salvation. So salvation to the king, save us, son of David, messianic king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are connecting these ideas together, these messianic concepts together, the kingship of the one who is the son of David who will sit on the throne. And they're getting really excited about this. So this large group of people surrounding Jesus, covering the road in front of him. I imagine this is such a huge spectacle. There are lots of people coming into Jerusalem for the feast And here comes this procession. This is unusual. People laying branches and clothing along the road to pave the way for this, whoever this is, riding this colt, this donkey, and singing these psalms, or speaking them and calling them out to one another. And then we finally arrive in Jerusalem. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? This is exactly where we need to be, isn't it? Jesus has been out in Galilee and out in the areas around Galilee and all over the countryside doing miracles and teaching and instructing and so forth, but he's now headed to Jerusalem and he is instructing his disciples about why he is going there, and we get there, and this is the right question to ask. Who is this? And what's the response? Verse 11, the multitudes were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And I don't know about you, when I read that, all the air goes out of it. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee? That's not incorrect, but that's completely inadequate. That's what people have been saying when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people I say I am? Well, some say you're a prophet, which is technically accurate. He is a prophet, but he is much more than a prophet. And he has been instructing them and teaching them and showing them and demonstrating that he is a he does have a prophetic office, but he is much more than that. And Peter for the disciples recognizing that. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, Jesus says to him. And so we have this multitude building this up and leading us here, and we finally get there, and it falls flat. It's interesting, the four Gospels record Jesus' entry in Jerusalem, and they all have a slightly different ending to it. Mark's, Mark has Jesus come in, and nobody notices which is technically what happens. They noticed, but they didn't notice. They saw him come in and asked, who is this? But they had no proper understanding of who he was. Just some rabbi, prophet, itinerant guy from up near Galilee, from Nazareth, that little podunk town up there to the north.
things get a little interesting after this. But I want to stop right here for a moment. Because we started asking that question as well. Who is this? Who is Jesus? Jesus has been instructing his disciples. He has been teaching and demonstrating to his followers. Who is he? Jesus is telling us. The question is, are we listening? And most of us in this room would say, yes, we're listening. We understand who Jesus is. But I want to take this in just a little bit further. Because Jesus has been confronting their expectations. Their expectations of who he is and what he's going to do. And that's, I think, a more interesting question for us. Are we paying attention to that as well? We claim to understand Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one who gave his life a ransom for many. He is the Savior of the world. But are we following Jesus as who he is, or are we following Jesus as who we want him to be? Is a question I think we need to continually ask ourselves. The blind men are correct about who Jesus is. They have no physical sight, but they have great spiritual insight. They're the only ones there who are calling out Son of David. And as Jesus stops to address them, we have this interesting contrast between what Jesus' agenda is and what the agenda of the crowd is. The crowd wants to ignore the blind men and get to Jerusalem. Jesus wants to stop and have compassion. We're still going to Jerusalem, but we're going to stop and have compassion along the way. Which I think is a great thing for us to think about. Because we can often be really, really busy doing good things. and miss the opportunities to do the things that Jesus would do. We can get caught up trying to fulfill our agendas and our to-do lists and our purpose and all of those things and miss the blind men on the side of the road who need compassion. We can miss the opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus to other people because we're busy focused on the goal ahead of us. We need to get to Jerusalem. And so we don't have time for these people over here, the interruption in our timeline. Jesus stops and has compassion. The problem for most of us isn't we're doing the bad things and we need to be doing the good things. The problem is we're busy doing the good things. The people wanting Jesus to move on to Jerusalem was a good thing in their, in their minds. We need to get to Jerusalem. That's where you're going. That's where you're going to give your life a ransom for many. That's where you're going to establish the kingdom. But in doing so, they're not thinking in terms of compassion. They're not thinking in terms of meeting the needs of people. And they completely ignore those who are in need. Jesus doesn't allow his goal and purpose to deter him from seeing the people. Maybe we need to ask ourselves that question as well. Are we busy doing good things and missing the things that Jesus would do? Secondly, when they get to the triumphal entry part, This is where we really begin to see Jesus came as Messiah, but he came in a very unique way. He did not come, once again he is showing them, he did not come on a war horse, in a chariot, in power. There's a huge contrast between the way Jesus enters Jerusalem here and the way he does in Revelation 19. 
where he comes on a white horse with a sword. Where he comes in power and majesty and glory. When he comes in the way I imagine many in this crowd were expecting him to come, were desiring him to come. There is going to be an entrance by Jesus in power and glory. You can flip to Revelation 19 later and read it. It's fantastic. It's the way I want Jesus to come. It's the way we all want Jesus to come. Power and glory with his army behind him and the sword comes out of his mouth and just slays all his enemies. Every knee bows, every tongue confesses. This shakes the earth. Here he comes, riding down the hill on a donkey. Very, very humble. Very different from their expectation. It's hard for us to think about that because we've seen the larger picture. They're still having trouble wrapping their heads around who is this and what is he doing because this is not how we imagined it. Which leads me to the question for us and for myself, what are my expectations of following Jesus? Am I in danger of being right where they are? Even the 12, yes, we recognize Jesus, you are the Messiah, that's why we gave up everything to follow you, but still, we have these expectations that in your kingdom we're going to be sitting on the right and the left, correct? Right? Yes? Tell us we didn't do all this for nothing. Tell us we didn't misunderstand this whole thing. You are going to Jerusalem to bring the kingdom, right? Now, it may not be exactly like we were thinking, but there are going to be fire and lightning from heaven and all kinds of, right? Right? And I wonder if we have that, I wonder if I have that problem with following Jesus. Have I brought my expectations to the table? Am I guilty of saying, Jesus, this is what following you is supposed to look like, right? Things are supposed to go a particular way. Yeah, there may be a few little bumps and, and things we need to work out here and there. I recognize that, but things are, in general, going to go this direction, and they're going to go well, correct? I mean, Emmanuel, God with me, this has to be a good thing. Let me read a couple of passages of Scripture about following Jesus. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul speaking here. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's how I think about following Christ. God has shown his light of who he is and who Christ is into my heart, given me the knowledge of the glory of God. Then he continues, but, oh, I hate it when he does that. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that in the surpassing greatness of the power of God may be from him and not from ourselves. And we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Is that the way we like to think about the Christian life? We're perplexed, but we're not destroyed. We're forsaken, we're beaten, we're crushed, we're... That's not how we normally talk about the Christian life. This is not normally what we think about when we sign up. But this is what Paul is talking about. We have the treasure of the glory of God in these earthen vessels. 
Why? So that the glory may be God's and not ours. But that means we're going to be afflicted, crushed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, but not destroyed. Hebrews chapter 12. Picking up in verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Oh, good. Just what I wanted to hear. I get, I know, I'm supposed to resist sin, but you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood, so there's more work to do. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons and daughters. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. No faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Is that how we like to think about following Christ? Not really. I've never seen that on a track, on a gospel track. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and he wants to discipline you. Come join up. You can be perplexed and crushed and struck down and persecuted. We we don't put that part on. No, we don't. Okay. James chapter 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflict among you? Is it not your pleasure that wages war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder? Hmm. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? God jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. How many times do we quote these verses to one another? Be miserable. You should be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into sorrow Because of your sin, he says. We shouldn't be happy about our sin. This is how we should feel about our sin. Until it brings us to a point of repentance and submission to God. But we normally don't talk about these things very often. James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, until the coming of the Lord. Do not complain against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. As an example of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job. Oh, let's not bring Job into this. The prophets and Job have that kind of patience and endurance. That's a tall order. First Peter chapter four, beginning in verse twelve. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for the testing 
as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Now, how many of you have gotten together with another believer and had them say something like this? You know, I'm going through a really difficult time. It seemed to be opposition and attack from everywhere, and I'm just rejoicing in the midst of it. The opportunity to suffer for Christ and endure and have my faith built. I don't know if I've ever heard someone say that. But what is Peter saying? That's what he's saying. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeals which come upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. How come we're always surprised at it? Man, hardship and opposition and testing and trial. Where's this coming from? Peter says, you follower of Christ? Yes, that's where it's coming from. Why is this shocking to you? It's like the guy on the football field with the ball. Why do people keep hitting me and running into me and trying to knock me down? That's the whole point of the game, sport. I had a quarterback like that one time. It was hilarious. He was really fast, which is why I had him at quarterback, because he was scared of getting hit. He said, why are they trying to hit me? Because you have the ball. Throw it, and they'll stop. <laughs> or run really fast, so they don't touch you. He's surprised. I was like, this, this is football. Peter says, this is a Christian life. Why is this surprising to you? Over in chapter 5, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Has that occurred to us? He's seeking someone, you and me, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters in the world around you. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What did he not say? If perchance, perhaps, maybe you suffer for a little while. No, after you suffer for a little while. And I could go on. I picked s several passages, but there are more in there. If this bothers you, you better close your Bible. Don't read any more. Now, are there good things about the Christian life? Absolutely. As the disciples said, Jesus said to them, do you guys want to leave too? And he said, you have life. Where else can we go? In Christ, we find life and purpose and rest and joy and peace and understanding and grace and mercy and truth and love, unconditional love. All of that, absolutely yes. And eternal life and joy, all of those things are true. I'm not denying any of those, and they are all in Scripture, all over the place. But so are these passages about what it is to really be a follower of Christ. So what's the point? The point is, just as the crowd, just as those following Jesus at the time had wrong expectations about what it means to be following along here with Christ, going into Jerusalem where he's going to set up the kingdom, we can sometimes develop wrong expectations about what following Christ looks like as well. We need to be careful that while we say, yes, we see and understand who Jesus is, that we are actually following him biblically. Not creating some false expectation about what it means to follow Christ. 
We need to understand these passages. What does God think about sin? And therefore, what should we think about sin? What does God do to his people when they sin, as far as discipline is concerned? And therefore, what should we think about the discipline of God? What does Jesus say about following him in terms of suffering and endurance, in terms of pain and exaltation, in terms of now and what is to come, in terms of resisting the devil and humbling ourselves before God? It's too easy to have a convoluted understanding of these things as we're getting input from everywhere else but Scripture. We need a good biblical basis for our understanding so that we can rightly understand what Jesus is saying about following him. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeals that you find yourselves in. Endure, persevere. Does that mean we are to be miserable people? No, actually, quite the opposite. When we rightly understand what following Jesus is, we should be the most joyful people because we have a right understanding of all these things. Our expectations need to be brought to Scripture so that we rightly understand what following the Lord Jesus Christ entails. Let me close this in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that your word gives us insight and truth into who you are and who we are and what life in you really entails. May we be diligent in aligning ourselves with your truth to expose the lies, to expose the fallacies, to expose the inventions and delusions of our thinking, to bring right and truth to our understanding of the Christian life, of our daily walk with Christ. That you might be glorified in who we are, in what we do, in how we think, in what we say. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.